Good evening. Welcome to Artist a la Mode. Thank you very much for tuning in. I'm your host, Dan Kaznitz, for tonight. And I'd like to introduce our two guests, uh, local artists and writers. We have Ms. Maisie Crowther and Mr. Charles Butterfield with us. And Charles Butterfield is back with us again. He was here earlier. And uh, we've got some, a variety of interesting creations from both of them that we're going to explore. Um, I'd like to start with you, Maisie, if I could, please. And uh, you're well known around town for your watercolors, but could you please tell us a little bit about your background and then why watercolor? Thank you, Dan. It's nice to be here, and I would just like to start with a little quote. I'm not sure, sure if it was uh, Isadora Duncan or Nureyev who said, <laughs> if I could say it, I would not have to dance it. And I think that's really one of the underlying things I'd like to think about tonight is the interdisciplinary role of arts. Mm. And watercolor is just one of the branches of art, um, one of the graphic arts. But I've always been interested in music and poetry, and these things weave together in a lot of my work, mm. beginning to weave a little bit more closely in my work, I should say. So why watercolor? And it's very easy to carry around. <laughs> you wouldn't know it from all the things that I've brought right. up here this afternoon. But uh, when I travel, I like to pack very little. And uh, I pre-size my paper, uh, cut it in mm. the dimensions I like, and I bring a little uh, palette and little brushes and uh, I just take them wherever I go with a sketchbook and um, it's just easy. Uh, I think the thing is I started in school mm -hmm. in Cambridge, uh, Shady Hill School, always believed in connecting the arts with the rest of the program, the rest of the curriculum mm -hmm. in history and English. So when we were studying about um, Lincoln, for instance, in the seventh grade. Mm -hmm. uh, we did a mural about the North and the South, mm -hmm. and um, I always felt kind of mm, resentful that other people in the class were asked to do that mural. But <laughs> this <laughs> but is when you were a student? It, uh, as a as student. As opposed to when you were an yeah. instructor later but on. It was all around us. Okay. We just, it was not a frill. It was part of our mm. curriculum, and so we all did part of it. And uh, then again in Concord Academy, uh, I had a very encouraging teacher. And Concord Academy is a, uh, a, secondary, a secondary, school. secondary school. For three years I was there, and then went off to Carleton College in mm -hmm. Northfield, Minnesota, and uh, studied history mostly. Mm. Uh, that was really what I studied, but art was again in my mind until and when I graduated I came back and took workshops and hmm. never went into a formal art school but they say self-made art I don't know it was just always in my, my in an interest right. of now I'd like to jump back to what you said yeah. as far as why watercolor mm. the first thing you mentioned was its portability yes so this clearly implies that a good deal of your work is done on location. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Um, do you also work in a studio, um, or is it exclusively on location? Well, I work on location when I can, in mm -hmm. the good weather. This morning I worked on my dining room table. Okay. <laughs> and well, that uh, is a location, <laughs> I suppose. Location. <laughs> <laughs> so it's my winter location. <laughs> right. um, I started off uh, really going full speed ahead when we were in Greece. In Greece, and when was in that? 1971 to 73. Mm. And, and uh, do you, in fact, I believe you have, uh, amongst the many wonderful samples you brought, you have something from that trip, is I that do. correct? The one you see over there okay. is the one I did of uh, the Paraportiani um, church in Mykonos. Mm. And I brought that one because it, it illustrates one of the first principles of watercolor, I think, which is leaving white paper. Mm. And Greece is just natural. Uh, the buildings are whitewashed. 
mm. the blue sky, and it's a very limited palette, so it's easy to not have to mix a lot of colors mm. there. So a lot of it was just sculpting out of the paper, the forms. And, and I'm sorry, what year was this done? 1973. 1973. Well, and at that point, had you been working with watercolor ever since uh, secondary school or before then? Before or, then. Okay, yes. before then. Yes. So, all right. Um, so when I uh, graduated from college, I came back and went to Rockport, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and took some uh, watercolor workshops. Um, and for folks who aren't familiar with Rockport, can you just describe okay. its location a it's little bit? It's very rocky, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> but and it, is it, there it a port? <laughs> it has a lot of fishing shacks. Okay. It has an awful lot of touristy artists mm -hmm. and with people who like to dress just right in the summertime. Mm -hmm. and, uh, they, but the, the artist I worked under was uh, Don Stone, mm -hmm. who is now in Monhegan Island, I believe. Mm. But his son, David Stone, is a well-known artist in Ipswich, Massachusetts, okay. where I grew up. Right, which is not too far from not Rockport. Not too far. So and Rockport, really, is, it's a charming place. Yes, it's very close to where I lived. So. Mm. And um, motif number one, mm -hmm. before it was washed away and rebuilt. Was um, do you of, actually have anything with you um, from Ipswich, Rockport, from that area? I do. Um, I do have this painting here. Sure, yeah, while we're talking about it, let's, let's take a look to give people a good idea. This is <coughs> a rendition of Crane Beach, and maybe I should take this out of its... And Crane Beach plastic. is where? It's in Ipswich. It's in Ipswich, okay. And I've done an awful lot of um, paintings from that area. It's been part of my recreation. Mm. I will say that recreation has been a, another underlying force in my pursuing watercolor and sharing it with mm. other people here at the Brattleboro Senior Center and right. other places. So. Uh, that brings up an interesting question of uh, sort of what the term recreation means in that yes. your artwork very much is a recreation of the scene. Yes. And, um, one of the things that I find with uh, pretty much all of your artwork is that there is actually, it's a tremendously accurate recreation, even though it's not a photographic impression. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm actually oftentimes astounded by the detail you get with the watercolor. Uh, certainly my um, horrific attempts at watercolor when I was younger, uh, real yielded perhaps Rorschach tests, but nothing else. <laughs> so um, the recreation as recreation, uh, it's both honoring the landscape, and landscape mm. seems to be, yeah. uh, natural subjects seem to be far and away. You brought choice. out an interesting um, conundrum mm -hmm. as to how accurate you have to be. One of the interests I've always had is geology. Mm -hmm. And Ipswich is full of drumlins in the marshland. And it's, I was brought up understanding the direction of the ice flow that mm. receded. And so when you have a feature here, this is called Steep Hill, which is part okay. of Castle Hill. Okay. And if you don't get that angle just right, the people who are in Ipswich will say, that's I'm not, not the right. <laughs> 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 However, everything else is fairly forgiving. Um, mm. You can have an oasis like this little lagoon right. and, and manipulate the grasses. Right. <laughs> but certain features in landscape, if people are looking for where is that from, right. where, did you, where were you sitting, they want to know exactly what your observation point is uh, or else it isn't accurate. Right. Enough. Then I have friends who are very interested in abstract and they will move everything around like a like puzzle pieces right, and uh, put it together differently. So art is not static. Right. And a creation that is really um, a process should move and should change you as you are mm. changing it too. Now between the, um, the one from Greece and, and this one you were just showing us, uh, both of them exhibit significant 
paper, white paper, yes. through them. Yes. Um, the, the reason for that, I was told by someone um, in the groups that I've been with, that when the light comes into the paper, it can bounce back through the color. Mm -hmm. So the more transparent the color that you apply to okay. the paper, the better the light reflection and transfer mm. into your retina right. yourself as a viewer. Um, the clouds in the up, upstairs there okay. <laughs> um, also illustrate that. Um, and these this ones that you just uh, showed us, uh, where are those from and when? Okay. The cloud one is a little bit of Round Mountain, which is very close to where I live. Okay. All right. And it was a summer right here day in, 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 in Vermont, in, in, Vermont, in, in Vermont. Brattleboro, West yep. Brattleboro. And the road that goes in is Ames Hill Road, okay. and where it meets Abbott Road. And the locals would know where that would oh, be. Oh, okay, sure. But Round Mountain has always been a landmark feature. Mm. And every time I go there on my way to and from home, I notice different light on the mountain or different uh, color in the fall. Mm. I like to paint. That's one of my favorite places to paint. And from there, is there a particular place you like to go to get the right angle on it? Or do you work from memory? How do you, how do you approach it? Uh, sometimes I take photographs. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I pull over to the side of the road. And um, I have to be a little careful because people think I've broken down. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll be very upset when they see that I have red on my... Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> ...my brush. And they think, oh, are you bleeding? But no, I'm fine. And thank you for asking. But, you know, so, yes, and, and right from what, throw. from what time period uh, are those pieces up there? Oh, these are recent. Okay. Um, this was a, the one on top with the four... Uh, is a typical kind of demonstration lesson. Okay. It's a little bit of a, a sequence in cloud formation and the use of certain techniques okay. for the sky. The, and a sequence, do you mean an, an instruct, a sequence of instruction? Yes. Okay. Yes. In other words, the, the upper part, the yellow, is a... Um, Oreo and yellow, okay. and it's just a variegated wash. Okay. So I wash, I ask people to wash down an area and apply the color. And then the one next to it is also variegated, but using Oreo and alizarin, crimson, and cobalt. Okay. And then so a little bit of. So if you were guiding a, one of your students through yes, this, would be I would be steps you would take them through. Talking to somebody about that. Um, the actually, cloud while we're on that, just quickly, yeah. uh, can you tell folks where you're currently teaching yes. and when? At the Brattleboro Senior Center. Okay. Uh, we've had a group there for 22 years now. Mm. And um, I was an instructor of that group, but now I'm just a member of it. Okay. And we instruct ourselves. Wow. It's very much of a sharing and open studio atmosphere. Okay. It's, it's really delightful, and I would invite anybody who would like to try to come and down. When does that meet? Wednesdays, 9.30 to lunchtime, okay. 12. And, and, and for information, contact the Brattleboro Senior Center? Yes, okay. or you can just contact the Senior Center. Okay. Yes. Yeah, the right. Recreation Department would know, too. Yeah. Uh, then, something I want to get back to, you were talking about uh, interdisciplinary work. Mm -hmm. I know one of the things you brought w for us is a poem mm -hmm. that also has some artwork with it. Uh, would this be a good time to move to that? Sure, sure. Yeah, if you could share um, that with us, please, that would be great. Way back in the 70s, <laughs> again, uh, we had come back from Greece, and we had understood that there was going to be an art, an interdisciplinary art workshop for a week on Star Island, mm. the Isle of Shoals. Okay. And so I was sitting out there doing a sketch, something like the background of what this one is, although okay. this is another splash <laughs> from another rocky coast. I think. Uh, an interesting thing, just while we're looking at this, yeah. the uh, 
foam of the sea rather than painting it, yeah. that's where you left the space. That's where I leave the space, yeah, fascinating. exactly. Yeah. Sometimes you can paint a little bit and put salt, mm. and that draws in the pigment, mm. and that leaves a speckly uh, texture. Interesting. Sometimes you just paint around something, like right. the Mykonos or the splash picture here. Right. A painting around the, the foam. It's really what you don't say. Right. So it's a very <laughs> conscious use of negative space yes. Yes. to give the full impression of, of, what, you're, of what you're drawing, Hopefully. what you're painting. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. Well, this is a, the, a little of what I wrote while okay. I was sitting there. And I had the back of a painting that I wrote this on originally, mm. because I had no other place to <laughs> Rocks, I am beginning to know you. Know your roughness, your friendly surfaces. You are unpredictable. Strains of felspar haphazardly crisscross ancient igneous granite. A wild iris clump has made its home in a niche like seagulls nesting in a convenient cleft. Butterflies visit from time to time as a scarlet pimpernel awaits its day. Grasses, shells, grasses, shells, mica, schist, glistens, rust, and lichens. Rocks, I am beginning to know you. You have a long way ahead to become pebbles along hurricane shore and sand and sand somewhere else. Minute red spire, spiders scurry and remind me when I'm next on a beach of the struggle of the grain of sand to become a finer grain of sand. Mm. And at the end of this workshop we had a chance to share some of the works that we had done. There was a music group, there were poetry groups, mm. and um, all kinds of things. And we just uh, traded paintings mm. all around. I have some of those paintings that other people did. That's wonderful. It was a very nice atmosphere for learning how to be a finer truly grain of sand. recreationally <laughs> creative, Right. I think it was. I've never been back there, but mm. I'd like to go there again. Thank you. Um, That's it's interesting. You come back to recreationally creative, uh, and it does seem to me sometimes people get fascinated with the function or the purpose of creation, mm -hmm. and at other times, people don't want to know it. They just want the experience. Right. Uh, it, it's an interesting um, yeah. uh, look both directions. Mm -hmm. um, do you find that your creativity, um, I don't know if this is even a fair question, is more for yourself or more for others, or is that not an, a question that hmm. crosses your mind? It crosses my mind. Uh, as they say, when you start painting, you walk into the room and you leave the critics outside. Mm. And in a way, I can't always leave my mentors outside. Right, interesting. But I paint, I think, mostly because it's just something I have to dance. I have to get that That's brush moving right. across the paper. I love the color. Uh, you have to really enjoy the activity. Mm. And I've always enjoyed the activity. So the process to you is also? M most important. Uh, most yeah. important. And uh, there's an awful lot of paintings that I put away and I think, I'll never want to see those again. Mm. And then I bring them out 10 years later and think, there was something in that painting mm. that I hadn't caught before. Right. Or something I liked about that one. And then that one, that goes <laughs> into it goes the away. tear up. Now, while we're talking about process, um, and Charles, also I may want to bring you in on this question because this applies equally well. Do you find that your experience during the process has anything to do with the quality of the results? Are they usually in lockstep, or are they sometimes different? Uh, to be clearer, how you feel during the process 
Does that typically predict to you how well it will come out, or is that not necessarily relevant? There's a nice word in French. I don't know if we have it in anything equivalent to it in English. Bricolage. Bricolage. Mm -hmm. And it refers to building things from what you have on hand. Okay. For example, if I were going to build a woodshed, I could draw a design for it, and then I could go to the lumber company, and I could order the pieces that I need to build that woodshed so that it fits the plan that I had drawn up. Or I could just start rummaging around and seeing what I have to work with, and I could put those things together to make the woodshed. And I would have no idea what the woodshed was going to look like, or only a very rough idea. Mm -hmm. Uh, because it would depend on what I can find at hand to work with. And I think art, to a large extent, is bricolage mm. in that sense. That you start with a project, you, you think you know where you're going to go with it, but very often, more, much more often than not, something will occur and you will swerve away from that original plan and mm. come up with something that surprises you. <coughs> it's those surprises that keep me going. Interesting. When I'm, when I'm writing, I, I, I really want them to happen, but you can't make them happen. Right, otherwise they wouldn't be a surprise, <laughs> right. by definition. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So... That speaks somewhat to what I'm wondering about. As an example, uh, sometimes you feel like you're on the track, you feel great, you're happy with what you're doing, and at the end result you look at it, or someone else looks at it and goes, hmm. And are there other times when you feel terrible and you think the experience is awful, the experience of the procedure is bad, you're pulling your hair out, but at the end you look at it and go, oh, there we are. I think there very much like Maisie was explaining, um, you will do a project, right. and then when, it, when you think it's done, you may not be satisfied with right. it, even though you were devoted to it in the beginning. Right. And so you can't bear to tear it up exactly, but you'll put it away and not, right. not think about it, try not to think about it <laughs> for a while, and then you'll bring it out, right. and maybe, just maybe, some part of that will strike you as mm -hmm. better, even, right. than what you thought you were going to do mm. with it. And so that's certainly true in the case of my writing. I, I write and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite mm. many, many times um, because I don't get it right the first time. Right. And I know it, and I can see it, and so I put it away and bring it out later, and sometimes, fairly often times, there'll be something that, that I really do want to work mm. with, and I can bring out, uh, bring the project to fruition. Right. Yeah. It's a multi, multi-step process. I rarely, once in a while, <laughs> will sit down and write a poem from beginning to end and have it. And, and no, no or a few edits. That's right. right. But that is a very rare event. Mm -hmm. Maisie, um, before we switch over to some of Charles's new work, what else have you brought with this, what, or brought with you, mm -hmm. that, you would, that you would like to show us? Last April, I had a chance to go to Tuscany mm. with the River Gallery group. Wow. It was sponsored by them. That's wonderful. I had a ball. And that's the River Gallery School right here in Brattleboro, right. is that correct? <clears throat> and a group of us, about nine artists, went for about a week to this lovely place, an old mill, where we stayed, had a wonderful breakfast of everything you could possibly imagine. Mm. And I learned about slow food. <laughs> <laughs> Italy is the place. Three hours in the evening. Did dinner dinner and starts it, and then goes we would and goes. Go and out on location. And then the grappa. <laughs> and this was one of the locations. It was on the top of an old Roman road, mm. an escarpment that must have been one of the 
Roman uh, citadels, you know, uh, where they had fires burning mm. from town to town right. to signal whatever they had to signal. And um, so we really tried to get the atmosphere of the place. Mm. And uh, the weather was beautiful. We had a lovely time. Um, this I was noticed, before mm -hmm. you take this one away, even with this one, where significantly more of the painting is covered, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, you're still getting some of the essential highlights with the negative space, with the white paper. I'm trying to keep the transparency of the right. watercolor. There's another water-based, there are many water-based medium media, like acrylic mm -hmm. and c colored pencil. Those things have been, uh, those are wonderful media mm. to use. But when you're working in plein air, <laughs> we're getting into the French again, en plein air, um, you, you want to get the feeling of that air, mm. in my mind. Right. I try to get the feeling that it's a warm day, the air is moving around, and you're just capturing a little bit of it on the paper right. in a moment mm. that you're there, or an hour that you're there. Right. <laughs> so using uh, when was this trip to Tuscany This again? was just a year ago, just April. April. 11. Okay. Yeah. Um, this one, I tried to use my imaginary zoom lens mm. and focus in on one of the little villas of which there were many dotted around on the countryside. And I thought it was fairly typical of, the, of what we saw because mm. of the tall pine, the cedars right. uh, and the red roofs and the little orchards, and they were just coming mm. into bloom. And uh, other people in the group did beautiful work. They had a really wonderful, wonderful time. So bringing that to the point where it's a portable medium. Right. And um, we had, I think there's a group that's planning to go this year, mm. I hope. Also to Tuscany go. again? Yes, mm. to Tuscany. Um, <clears throat> here's a local scene, uh, South Pond. I was going to say in Marlboro. In right? Marlboro. And it's the view from the Ames Hill Association Beach toward the Marlboro Beach. Right. And, and, and I on was the able <laughs> to recognize it immediately at South Pond. So, yeah. Even though I, I couldn't exactly say which part, but it looked at, oh, there's South mm -hmm. Pond. So whatever elements you chose to portray realistically, mm. there were enough in there to give me reference. That's hopefully right. <laughs> what I like to communicate. Right. Um, there are so many things that are, I call, forgiving subjects, and one of them mm. is trees and ponds and <laughs> things that are moving and growing. Mm -hmm. The things that are harder to paint are buildings, for me, and portraits. So mm. I try to minimize that, but try to study a few things like shells. Mm -hmm. And uh, wow. this is just a study. And this helps me focus for an hour or two. And I'm uh, completely oblivious when I'm painting from a, a, a little collection like this. Right. Just every little detail. Uh, oblivious meaning oblivious to? My surroundings. Right. <laughs> OK. So, so one might say, actually, focused. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, very focused. For lack of any other words. <laughs> right. Um, this this was a real challenge. This is the, the Gibson Aiken Center. Ah, yes. And I brought a um, number of calendars. For five years now, we've produced a calendar amongst the Brattleboro Senior group. Okay. And uh, each of us ha gets a month to <laughs> illustrate. And now, you, you have a month of the year for a picture, uh, not, you, not right. time to do a not, month not to not do the your time. No. <laughs> But about um, August, we get a little panicked, and we think, if we're going to do it, we better get uh, something in. Right, as the months are Yeah. Where and now? this year is um, this year is a nice wow. cover. 
And are, are those members? 2012 calendars, are those available at the Senior Center? Well, I, I'm happy to report they are all sold out. Wow. <laughs> we have them printed locally and uh, by a local Lotus. Mm. And we can only budget right. just so many. And then each of us buys what we want to have. Wow. So anyway, uh, they're, they're, they're wonderful for gifts. And is this something that, uh, obviously planning for next year, is this something that is available um, we early in the year? We will try to, yeah. This was last year's mm. calendar and uh, through Brattleboro. And this is a very popular one. We actually did print more of mm. these. But these are the last ones. And we had people, I mean, it's, it's a lovely thing for us to do. Mm. And we have fun doing it. It's not what you call polished, perhaps, in some respects, but it's who we are. It seems wonderful. It's the old. Yeah. <laughs> and um, we had fun with this one, with various significant mm. landmarks. Excuse me, my throat was a little dry. Quite, quite all right. Um, so, what would you say to an aspiring watercolorist? Um, keep painting. Mm -hmm. Have it set up. Have it? You mean your your, 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 your workspace materials, materials? Your workspace at least available close by, mm -hmm. so that you can run to it when you need to, mm. and uh, take carve out some time every day mm. if you can, which is very difficult. Right. Take a sketchbook with you. Right. So again, the portability in the car, and then from your sketchbook mm. you can work later on. Many different things. <laughs> Right now, I'd like to take the opportunity to mention uh, a project where your work overlaps, in fact, where I believe, uh, Charles, uh, that you're working on a book and, and that uh, Maisie is actually going to be doing the artwork for the cover. That's correct. Um, yes. Could you describe the book a little bit and, and Maisie perhaps uh, describe what the cover is going to look like and then we'll delve into it a little bit deeper? Sure. Um, the book is a reconstruction of the life of an ancestor of mine mm -hmm. who was disgraced during the Revolutionary War, mm. but recovered from that. From his disgrace. They didn't hang him after all, right. okay. although they thought about that at the time. Um, mm. And he became a uh, taverner and a farmer in mm -hmm. Westmoreland, New Hampshire. Okay, not too far from here. Not far. and. Um, he, he built a very nice house, um, suitable for a tavern, so it was big. Mm -hmm. and, the, and someone from Massachusetts bought it back in the 1920s and took it apart and moved it out of Westmoreland down to Sudbury, Massachusetts. Wow, where they have some uh, well-preserved taverns of their own yes, there. Yes, yeah, they do. <laughs> the wayside being not the least of them. <laughs> so... Um, for this book, I wanted a picture of Isaac Butterfield's tavern, mm -hmm. and we had some photographs, snapshots that people had taken over the years before, before it was the, moved, before the house was taken down. None of them of high quality mm -hmm. at all, barely reproducible. So I showed them to Maisie, mm -hmm. and I said, "Could we do a watercolor?" giving you know, kind of an impressionistic uh, watercolor because we don't know what the land, the lay of the land was mm -hmm. uh, 200 years ago. And, um, but we do know that this big house was next to the road. Mm -hmm. And so Daisy has begun to do sketches from the photographs that we have. Wow. And I'm looking forward to seeing the, the painting. One of the things I've done that you've seen are my little thumbnail sketches. Yes. Right. Which helps figure out the proportion of mm. house to land to orchard to the back hills. And uh, Westmoreland was a, is a very lovely town. Mm. I happened to work in the library there for mm. about 14 years. Mm. So 
I knew the terrain a little bit, but again, it's the feeling of the area. It's and, beautiful. Uh, so it was fun to go and see the site of mm. this tavern. And there's no other building on the site at the moment? There is. Oh, there is. Mm -hmm. When he built the tavern, he built an L on the end of the house, okay. the side of the house. And when the w woman who bought the big house um, took it down, she left the L there. And that has been made into a very nice home, uh, still occupied. So we know exactly where the right. tavern was. Uh, uh, an interesting technical question. As you're working on the painting, do you know the dimensions of the book to give you a, uh, a size and shape roughly. constraint? Yeah, roughly. I'm not sure exactly how big the book will be. Big, right. we I think don't. it'll be standard size. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, as far as height and, and width is concerned, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And we're hoping, I'm hoping, that this painting will wrap around mm -hmm. part okay. of the, the back. Uh, there's talk now of its being a hardback book, which means that it will have a paper cover, right. which, but also a paperback book. Um, right. And I don't know. I, it may be both. Right. Uh, we'll see. We'll have to think of a, a big cloud into which the title and the author mm. yeah. may yeah. be superimposed. Mm. I mean, you have to think of the design of a book jacket yes, with that in that's mind. That's true, mm -hmm. yeah. The title isn't very big, but on the other hand, it's got to be yes. there. And yeah. what is the title of the book? The title is The Heat and Burthen of the Day. Mm. And or why that particular title um, for this book about it your was a, It was an ancestor. expression used in those days whenever people wanted to claim that they were owed something because they had worked so hard uh, ah. to do it. So this was a, actually a biblical quotation. Ah. And the burthen is <coughs> simply burden, but from the old King James okay. Version, it was spelled B-U-R-T-H-E-N okay. at the time that uh, Isaac uh, Butterfield was uh, living in Westmoreland. So that's the spelling that I use in the Title. So before we go back to um, uh, Isaac Butterfield, can you tell us just a little bit about yourself and your background? Well, I started as a high school science teacher, mm -hmm. and I had a long career, 37 years. And where was that? And 32 of those years were here in Brattleboro. Okay. That's... I taught both biology and chemistry. Okay. And uh, as part of that, I I wrote a number of uh, science education articles okay. and also a book called Biology and Values, which was quite popular back in the 1980s. Now, Biology and Values, what do you mean by well, that? Well, it was a book designed for biology teachers to be able to introduce social issues mm. into their biology course. So it, it usually started with some kind of a paper and pencil exercise in which the students were able to provide their, their, their values, their opinion of, of some issue that was coming along, like, uh, well, at that time, uh, the whole environmental, the whole green mm -hmm. earth uh, thing was a, was, a big, was a big issue. So um, the students would act, would work through these paper and pencil exercises, and then the teacher would lead them into a discussion of what is, what, what is your, va what, do you, what do you really value about this particular issue, and how does biology t tie into it? That was my question, is that is this sounds more uh, conventional to say social studies curriculum. So sure. how, did, how did you get the inspiration to tie those two together, and, and what is your justification for the, the interdisciplinary work between well, those two fields. All of the fields. cases that I chose had a good, firm foundation in either biology or chemistry. Okay. Um, like, Can you give an example? Well, like the Silent Spring. Mm -hmm. remember, remember the big is issue about DDT being oh. sprayed around? Oh, okay. So um, after, the, after the students had thought through what, what the problems were with that um, issue, then they were introduced to uh, how the egg is formed in, in a bird and right. how the DDT 
is um, concentrated as you go up through the food chain right. and how it affects the, the uh, structure of the egg and so forth. So it was a way to get into um, an environmental issue, mm. a, a, a biological issue, by way of a uh, controversial subject. Right, or vice versa. Or vice versa. Right, That's get into right. the controversial subject yeah. from the uh, structural or scientific reasons that generated the controversy in the first place. Sure, right. Fascinating. Yeah. Well, it was, a, it was a popular book for maybe 20 years or mm -hmm. so, uh, but those issues are now old hat, so the, <laughs> the book went out of print. I was offered the opportunity to re Advise it, bring mm. it up to date, but I, by that time my interest had gone on to other things, mm. so I didn't take up. And the other that. things being? Well, since I retired, my interest has been chiefly in history, okay, and particularly history of this area, um, but also theology. I, I read a lot of theology, I read a lot of poetry, and um, creative literature. Mm. The interest in values is that uh, common throughout your your um, your interests, such as, as history and theology. Um, just c carry that thread for me a little bit further, mm. since I find it somewhat notable that you would have integrated values into chemistry and biology. Mm -hmm. uh, where have you gone with that <laughs> since then? Um, or where do you think you're going? <laughs> where do I think I'm going? Yes. Um, well, certainly in the, uh, in the realm of history, there's a, a, a strong overlap between what, ha what people do, how they right. cope with problems right. and so forth, and, and, the, and that creates the social issue right. of the day. Um, you mean even though we do our best to forget everything we've learned historically and, yes, and, and, and reinvent the same mistakes over and over yes, again at, right. at, just at a higher level? Uh, there is sometimes some scientific um, connection. Mm -hmm. For example, one of the, one of my writing projects now, not, not the one that um, we started to talk about with uh, Isaac Butterfield, but another one, is a a book about my gathering information about how land has been used. Mm. over a 200-year period on a farm w that I grew up on. Okay. Uh, I only lived there for 20 years, but my well, family that's, that's my okay. family has owned it and mm. farmed it for, well, 160 years anyway, and then now it's not an active farm. So recently, I have been going back there, camping out on the stream that runs mm. through that um, farm, but also this stream connects two little villages within the town okay. where I live, two rather important villages historically. Um, and what I'm doing is taking very careful notes of my observations of mm -hmm. land use and of the ecological changes, the succession, the, the forest succession that is occurring around this stream trying to work my way back to what the place must have been like when it was settled mm, right. and what the farmers had to do there to make it into a productive farm okay. that supported big families for centuries. And um, at the risk of uh, reading more in than may be there, uh, would you say that some of this research will either reveal or, or raise questions about the values of the people had as how they used the land? Oh Is yes, reflected? A absolutely. Okay. Oh yes, yeah, sure. Right. Uh, as far as the early settlers were concerned, the land was simply to be used. That's all they thought about. Right. They were not thinking about conservation right. at all. It didn't seem at all important because there was so much of everything. So much. And also, mm -hmm. at that time, they, while they did have, certainly have the capacity to clear cut uh, massive uh, tracts of land, uh, they didn't have some of the biological components to use that would leave lasting toxic true. impressions. That's, that's true. What, whatever impact they had on the land was temporary. Right. Um, 
really the, the, the most lasting evidence that I've found on my hikes along this brook were the stone walls mm. uh, that they built. Right. And uh, I, I'm, I'm just fascinated mm. by the amount of labor that went into the building of those uh, stone walls. And so I did a lot of reading about how come you know, we have all these stone walls in New England, but you don't see them in Indiana or, right. or anywhere. So that brought me uh, to the uh, study of, of glaciation that, okay. that took place over, right. cent over millennia. Right. And, um, and to the realization that it was in the clearing of the land that they, that the farmers uh, ended up with this crop of spring potatoes, as they called it, because well, by opening up the land, the frost went deeper into the ground, mm -hmm. lifted the rocks, rocks up, they needed to get rid of the rocks. And so every spring they had rocks to get rid of. Right. right. And so a lot of the stone walls that we see in the woods today, we might think of as boundaries of fields, but in fact, they were simply piles of these rocks that had to be gotten out of the way. Getting out of the way. Right. And um, because it's very hard work to lift stones up. They generally didn't lift them much higher than their own knees or their own thighs. And they didn't want to take them too far afield and either. they didn't want to have to carry them very far, so it was easy just to make a line of rocks um, along the edge of the field. And that, that's also why it, it, when you walk through the field, uh, walk through the woods these days, you'll see rather small fields, uh, the, the remnants of right. rather small fields, only because it was a lot of work to carry those stones right. out of there. Now, I'd like to bring us back um, to your ancestor, yeah. uh, Mr. Butterfield. Can you, what is your relation to him? Well, how many generations and... All right, Isaac Butterfield. Isaac Butterfield. Okay, Isaac Butterfield is my great, 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 great grandfather. Uh, <laughs> and so he was, when did he live? He, he was born around 1742, Okay. so he was just a kid when um, the uh, French and Indian Wars were being wow. fought, and he suffered, his family suffered quite, quite uh, severely during those French and Indian Wars. But then he was a young man, unmarried, when finally the French and Indian Wars were over, and the land along the Connecticut River became available to people who were confined essentially to Massachusetts and Connecticut right. all during the French and Indian Wars because of the raids that were occurring mm. in what's now Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. So in 1764, he and four brothers, Isaac Butterfield and four of his brothers, moved, not necessarily together, but within a short right. period of time, to Westmoreland. Okay. And uh, each of them bought up land and started farming. And Do you know why they chose Westmoreland or how? There's a theory that um, even though the French and Indian War was going on, the farms were so crowded in Massachusetts that the farmers had no pasturage for their dry cattle. They had to, they had to reserve the pasturage that they had for the cows that they were milking. So the dry cattle, the ones not old enough to give milk yet, or those that were uh, waiting to be bred, uh, were driven up into southern New Hampshire okay. uh, in the spring, and they left them in the in fields uh, there um, for the summer, and then there would be a cattle drive back okay. in the fall. So the theory is that in the course of doing that year after year after year, the Massachusetts farmers discovered where the good land was okay. um, up in New Hampshire and Vermont, and just just waited until it was until safe could settle it. Uh, okay. to settle there. Um, well, could you please read a bit from this book? I, I'd be glad to. I think that would be a great way um, to introduce people to it. As I say, the, the book is a reconstruction of the man's life. So it starts with his growing up. Mm -hmm. in, uh, in southern Massachusetts. But for this, uh, for, for now, um, I'm going to read a portion of a, an event that occurred in Westmoreland. So okay. this is after Isaac Butterfield had moved here and also after he had built his tavern. 
His tavern was located not very far, maybe a quarter of a mile from the first meeting house in um, uh, West Milan. So what I wanted to do in, in this passage was to give some kind of an indication of the role of the minister in the little New Hampshire town and also show something of Isaac Butterfield's position okay. in the town. And I, I was able to find a fairly detailed report, much more detailed report of this event than many other mm. events in the town, uh, because it was so significant, I think, to, to everyone. I should remind you that this is 1774, so we're 10 years or more, more than 10 years from a constitution right. in which separation of church and state occurred, or right. maybe occurred. Right, that's some the, form of it. That's the issue today. So, um, at, the, at the time that this took place, there was no separation of church and state. The town hired the minister, the town paid the minister, mm -hmm. and it was up to the town to decide when the minister was no longer effective. And that's what this is about. It is hot by mid-morning when the council assembles at the meeting house staying just long enough to dispense with formalities and then to adjourn to Isaac Butterfield's tavern for the more difficult part of their mission. The windows are thrown open to catch any August breeze, but the shutters are closed over the west windows to keep out the hot sun. Around the table, eight men, some of them sweating and out of breath from their quarter-mile trek, talk and listen, their demeanor solemn, in keeping with their dark business dress. The men are ministers and delegates who have come from the churches in Cornish, Walpole, Chest, Charlestown, and Claremont, some a full day's journey from home. The town has called this council to decide how to proceed in a matter concerning its pastor, Reverend William Goddard, who sits at the table with the council. The tavern keeper, off to one side, watches to see when more switchel is called for. He overhears the quiet conversation. This is not a closed meeting. The gentlemen begin their official consideration of the letters the pastor's congregation has filed with them. Major Butterfield settles by a window where he can keep his eye on the cloud bank building in the distance, yet still hear the conversation. The room is stifling. A half dozen horseflies beat against the low ceiling. Isaac Butterfield knows William Goddard. They are near neighbors. The major has, on occasion, made small loans to the minister, and Goddard is accustomed to stopping by the tavern to visit. But Butterfield is aware that some in town, if not he, have grown dissatisfied with their preacher. He is aware that the selectmen and committees from the Congregational Society have met frequently of late to discuss matters with the Reverend Goddard. Through the long afternoon, the sun by turns covering, covered by thickening cumulonimbuses, then piercing the air with blazing rays, heats the room unmercifully for the discussion, as the discussion drones on. A council member raises a point. Has Reverend Goddard been negligent in administering gospel ordinances? Mm -hmm. Goddard mumbles his tired denial, saying, that once when he held catechism at Canoe Meadow, not one person showed up. Point by point, the counselors build to their final conclusion. From his brief replies to their questions, it is clear to all that the pastor is mightily discouraged. On account of the difficulties and hardships he has met with and the unsuccessfulness of his labors, in his opinion, his usefulness in the place is at an end. Goddard finally requests of the council that on any honorable terms, the relation between him and his church and people be dissolved. There can be no reconciliation. The council adjourns to the meeting house where their recommendation is read to the church and people. Those assembled give vocal consent to the terms. Reverend Goddard readily complies and Chairman James Wellman declares his pastoral relation to be dissolved. Um, I won't take 
more time, but that's the kind of writing mm. that I'm doing. I, I, I call it narrative nonfiction because it's based on facts right. all the way through, but I tell those facts in narrative form to, to make a story. Mm -hmm. So obviously there was no record of the exact number of horse flies. That's correct. Right. That's right. Uh, so that's your... But there was a... There was, I, I found a journal written by a man who lived nearby who kept very detailed records of the weather. Mm. So this storm that I talk about, or the uh -huh. building of the clouds and the heat of the day... Interesting. ...is factual. All right. <laughs> and uh, uh, can you describe a few other books that are done in the style of narrative fiction to, to orient our listeners? Sure. Our viewers. Um, I just reread a book that I read a few years ago called The Survival of the, Bur of the Bark Canoe mm. by John McPhee. John McPhee often writes in this style, this narrative nonfiction style. And in this book, he visited a young man who builds canoes out of birch bark mm -hmm. in the way the Indians okay. built them. And he is a master of the art. And so McPhee went and uh, stayed with him, watched the details of the building of the canoes, mm -hmm. went on a long canoe trip up into Maine with the man. Mm. So uh, while it's factually correct in terms of how the boat is built, okay. um, there's so much more because you come to know okay. the man who built the boat, you come to know why and how he took up this trade, mm -hmm. and um, you, you get to know Maine just because they go there to, to test out the canoe. Mm. So it, 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 it's, a, I think, a really good illustration of what the narrative nonfiction writer does. Um, tells the facts, but spins a good story, a good story in the process, process of and, doing uh, where will this book be available? Where in, in the, the book by Lane? Isaac Butterfield about Isaac about Butterfield Isaac, okay. will be published by the Historical Society of Cheshire County. Okay. I don't know um, exactly when they're still negotiating with printers and so forth. So. But will we be able to find this at our at local? Yeah, well, I hope so. I certainly hope so. Great. Right. Probably right. this summer or this fall. And uh, is there anything that you would like to say? To, as Maisie did, to, to folks that are interested in writing? Well, <laughs> um, I think I've already said it. I, th I think to, to be a writer, you've got to be willing to, to be patient mm. with what you're doing. Um, ex expect that the first things that you produce are not going to really be very satisfactory. Expect to spend a lot of time going back over it and over it and over it, mm. and if possible, find someone who can and is willing to read what you mm. have written and give you feedback. And I would assume that implies being open to the being feedback open as to well. Feedback. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> well, it has been wonderful having the two of you with us again, Charles Butterfield uh, and Maisie Crowther. Um, this has been Artist Alamode. Thank you folks so much for tuning in. Um, and I hope that we'll see both of you here again soon. And Maisie, thank, thank you. you so much for your wonderful artwork and Charles for reading for us. Yeah, and uh, yeah, please keep in touch with us and let us know your new creative developments. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dan. All right, well, thank you folks very much again for tuning into Artist Alamode. I've been your host, Daniel Kasnitz, and have a wonderful evening.